again. Welcome back, footy fans, to another episode of Donnie's Disposals. I am your host, Coach Donnie Hess, here back with another AFL round review. I know this is probably going to hit your inboxes just the tiniest bit after the first game of the next round, but we got to review round five. And joining me, one of my fellow American footy heads, Mr. Gil Griffin. Gil, great to see you, sir. Hey, great to see you, too. What's go What's going on, man? It is not going too bad, as we were kind of saying off mic. We've had some, I've had some fun this week, and the best part is, is that for those watching on the YouTube video, a beautiful background in the background of California there. So, but we are here to talk footy. So, really quickly, before we go nuts and bolts of each of the games of round five, just a quick thoughts on the footy through round five. Well, I'll tell you what. A um, couple of things surprised me a little bit. Um, it really did surprise me that uh, that Melbourne are still uh, or, or, or the Melbourne Brisbane rivalry is, is well and truly alive because uh, that whole Brisbane swipe at Harrison Petty, you know, you, you thought it was over. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that got brought up again. I mean, um, after Dane Zorko's uh, little stunt um, uh, when Harrison, when he said something to Harrison Petty that that brought him to tears about his mom, you know, you thought that was well and truly over, and then here's a Brisbane player re rehashing the whole thing again. So th that surprises me, and really has to has to make you wonder because that happened around the same time you got uh, Jeremy Finlay Finlayson, who was suspended for the homophobic slur, mm -hmm. and you know, you just really have to wonder where the line can be and should be drawn with uh, with on field banter. We were talking off camera about banter and when it's good natured and when it's personal and when it's not good natured. So that was one thing. Then the other thing was, I guess, Geelong uh, playing in what looked to be a, uh, you know, a, a glorified training run uh, against, uh, against North. That was really something. Um, and then of course uh, for Fremantle, two successive heartbreaks in a row uh, on the same field away uh, it's funny, Ben Dixon made the comment um, on the post-match that was really funny, saying that the Dockers probably want to burn uh, Adelaide Oval to the ground uh, <laughs> after that. So that was another thing. Um, and uh, th yeah, there, then also, uh, boy, Mitch Owies, boy, going the dribble, what was he thinking? Mm -hmm. You really have to wonder about that. You know, when we were just talking about watching bounce and how – uh, the chief Jason Dunstall hates the dribble kick. And I I really did not understand what was going through Mitch always mind there. Why in the world would you try a dribble kick when he had plenty of space in front of him? Because sometimes I get the question from other Americans. Well, is there a goalkeeper in AFL? And if I have a footy in my hand, I just reenact why it doesn't make sense to have a goalkeeper. Cause I kicked it right. I kick it right over somebody's head. So I really, just I'm I'm perplexed by that one because Carlton really should have won that match and they should still be undefeated at this point, and and so that was um that was really costly for them, uh so those those are some of my thoughts and then of course I guess with uh, with Collingwood and Sydney having the bye, uh you know getting getting their rest and all of that and getting ready for this week and GWS still top of the table so a lot to talk about. Yeah, ton, tons of different storylines. I mean, we had a one point finish, a two point finish, and a three point finish all in all in the round, sprinkled with some absolute, absolute smashings, as as you said, with the Cats North game being 75, which I joke, I actually had I actually like two minutes before first bounce switched in my fantasy team, switched Jeremy Cameron to my captain. <laughs> Boy, did that wow. move help out a lot <laughs> I, I bet it did i really bet it did you know jeremy cameron i had him on uh, on my fantasy team last year so i'm sure that that uh, that really paid some some big dividends there yeah uh, he, we had he had 122 and then with the captain's double made it 244 so that was that was a nice little nice little decision like through like i said like three minutes before first bounce so let's let's jump to it first round first game of the round thursday night footy as we said says sees brisbane kind of Again, throw the shocker, getting the win at the MCG, 82-60. And again, the D's forward troubles, again, rear its ugly head at the worst possible time. Yeah, it did. And then you really have to wonder if you're Brisbane, is this going to be the thing that kind of kickstarts their season after a really slow beginning and, and a real struggling beginning? And their twin towers were looking really good in uh, Eric Hipwood and Joe Danaher, uh, really taking care of business there. 
And uh, yeah, you're right though about the Melbourne forward line. It really looks like it's it's in uh, in in quite a shambles. Um, but uh, you know, I'm I'm really thinking about about Brisbane. Does this really really launch their season? Because they sit now not too far up from the top eight. And you know, you, you gotta they weren't a grand finalist runner up for no reason. And so you have to think that they're going to bounce back eventually. And then we come back to the same point, uh, Donnie, that we talked about years ago when the Swans started the campaign 0-6 mm -hmm. at one point. And it's really interesting because I, I told uh, a, a very uh, special Swans um, supporter in my own household, uh, my lovely wife, I was saying to her, you know, don't count the Swans out. I don't care that they're 0-6 right now. They're going to find a way. So you really have to wonder with all the things that went on with Brisbane in their off season and, and um, all of that, are they going to find their way back? I don't think taunting Melbourne players, as I said before, is really that great an idea. Uh, but because uh, those two will uh, are, are likely to meet again if, if they both make the finals. So we'll see what happens with that. That'll be definitely interesting. And it's, and I hate putting it down to one player, but why does it seem like whenever Kaziah Pickett is out, these, these, these problems just persist almost almost immediately. Like, and again, I think Ben Brown, Ben Brown's issue is, is that I don't think he's the Ben Brown of a few years ago. I still think, I think his knee is still bothering him. Bailey Fritch is one of those that he can get hot, but he kind of needs somebody to take a little bit of pressure off him. And then Pachaka can go, Pachaka can go forward, but Brisbane kind of threw their wings at him a little bit, which kind of, I think threw Petraka off. I still think Clary Oliver, it was still fighting that finger injury. I think I heard somewhere that he's actually going into surgery. So he may actually miss around. This is a, this is a Melbourne team that I think this is one of those that got away from them a little bit. Brisbane, you're kind of happy because it kind of writes the ship for the, it kind of writes the ship for them a little bit. I'm with you. I'm just, I, I'm still, I still got question marks on Brisbane because Kitty Coleman is still a massive loss. Uh, right. Zorko has stepped back there, but has he done everything? Not exactly. I think Connor McKenna may be back this round, which could be that missing piece that they've been missing, but we'll have to see again, both these teams. I've still got question marks. I think both on their day can be finals teams, but there's still enough question marks in different parts of the grounds that I'm still kind of, I'm going to hold my cards to my chest a little bit when it comes to whether these two will make finals. Let's jump to another one that I know is the talk of a lot of Vic, a lot of talk radio. And that is the Western Bulldogs as they drop one at Marvel stadium by 29, 96, 67. And everybody's talking about it is i mean is bevo in trouble because his selections have just not worked out he started with some youngsters and really if i'm being honest none of these youngsters have really done what we know guys like caleb daniel and and some of their experienced guys that are finding themselves in the vfl can do yeah and then they're getting a little long in the tooth with some of the other players jason johannesson for one uh, and you wonder how much uh, how much longer the bond is going to be able to keep doing his thing week in and week out, and for how many years? Um, you know, Jamara Eugle Hagen uh, seems one week like he's going to tear everything up, and then the next round he's he's not in as great form as you might think. And I think also they've got the big injury concern with Tom Liberatore, mm -hmm. um, that with the with the concussion and his being, uh, or not the concussion with his with his um, uh, basically. Um, I don't want to call it fainting, but but his um, his collapsing uh, mm -hmm. on field that was that was really something too. And then also they sank a lot of uh, a, a lot of a big investment in Rory Lobb, mm -hmm. and then you know who I know well from from um, not personally but know his play well from being a Fremantle, and um, it just seems like it hasn't gone exactly as as they planned. And you're right, um, Bevo could be in in real big trouble. Have the dogs really seen? Have we really seen the best of the dogs when they won the grand final in 2016? Just never to return. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this doggies team. It's I and I and I kind of agree with some of the talk radio issues. Is that right now there's a huge miscommunication between the football side and the board side because right now the board, if you listen to the board, they've got a top four list. Which, I mean, if you look at some of the names that they have, the Trelores, the Bontempelis, the Libertores, the Jamara Ugo-Hagans, they do, I mean, have name recognition. Yes, Bailey Smith is out this year, but we knew that going into the season. So th that one, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you kind of rest on the laurels of that one. It's just that when Bailey Dale is being a sub, Caleb Daniels is a sub and you're just, there's, 
again, this is coming from somebody sitting in the cheap seats. It's very easy to chuck popcorn and say, you're doing it wrong when you're not at training all the time. But I've seen Bailey Dale and Cable, D Caleb Daniels off the halfback flanks absolutely tear teams apart with their kicking. But Lockie Bramble's in there, and Lockie Bramble had three clangers, or if not four clangers in this last game that, all due respect, Caleb Daniels and Bailey Dale would not do. So I'm just, I'm... I don't know what to say. Like I, I, I could sit here and say his his selection has been absolutely atrocious. Again, I'm one of those. I said it when Rory Lobb left Fremantle. I said that's an addition by subtraction. I don't understand why Lobb went there. You had Darcy. You had Jamara Uglehagen. You have Naughton. Why do you need another tall? I just don't. I did not understand that move at all. For me, that was. If I'm Fremantle, I'm saying thank you. Bye bye. Like that well, was the literally thing is too, with, with, with Aaron Naughton too. I mean, the reshuffling of his role. Um, you know, because he he looked like he was going to be a, a twin, you know, one of the twin towers, a fixture in the forward line there mm -hmm. forever. And then that that's gone uh, by the wayside. And it's interesting what you say about when you when you with the disconnect between the board and um, and, and the reality, because also the women's side has had the same issues, too. I mean, the women's side has some great names on it, but they had a horrendous year this mm -hmm. past season. And it just seems like uh, both programs are, are really in trouble right now. Yeah, unfortunately, and, and, and it really and it really stinks because, like I said, there's some absolutely magnificent talent. But I just like, I feel like the co the coaching staff and the football department and the board and the top bowl level board just there's a major disconnect, and I worry it's it's gonna. I think it could potentially cost Bevel his job unless he gets things going. So let's jump from the basket, the the dumpster fire that is the Western Bulldogs, to an absolutely cracking game up in Canberra at Manuka Oval as the Giants survive. A Ross Lyons Saints led scare by one, 80 79. The Giants are human, but this is an impressive win knowing that both Stephen Canelio and Sam Taylor both go down in this game and you still find a way to get the four points. Well, that's what a championship team has to do, or, or a premiership side has to do. And you wonder if the Giants uh, have graduated into that because uh, we all remember uh, the fiasco that was their first grand final appearance against Richmond. Uh, mm -hmm. years ago so you really wonder you really wonder are these going to be the same old giants that uh, that make it and they're the bridesmaid but not the bride um, because also they lost to the western bulldogs in 2016 in one of the best preliminary finals i think you and i have ever seen mm -hmm. um, but it, it's very interesting to see what is what's going to happen with them um, they have a lot of interesting players to keep an eye on. I mean, much to Fremantle's chagrin, you have Jesse Hogan, who uh, has been done really well for, for GWS. And I think a lot of Fremantle fans are probably thinking, well, why couldn't he have done that uh, at Fremantle? But it's just interesting about you take one player out of one background and you throw that player into different scenery and different things can happen. Mm -hmm. And um, so he's probably thriving in an area where, he doesn't have the pressure of family and friends or performing in front of family and friends. Um, I mean, as a human being, I have to be happy for him because uh, it seems like he's managed his uh, his alcohol issues. Uh, and he's also was, de was dealing with the loss of his father. He also is a testicular cancer survivor. So the human being in me has to really say you know, good on him um, for, for finding a second, uh, a second career because it was really all but over um, in Fremantle who just gave him away. Uh, so, so that's one thing. Now, on the other hand, though, uh, the Toby Green, it seems like Toby Green is always in the thick of something controversial. And, uh, and, and, and the one thing also, um, that I just, I, that I just remember too, is, and I guess we're going to get to this is the whole issue with tackling now, um, which, which I guess we can come back to in, in the area about dangerous tackles and whatnot. Um, but yeah, the giants, I mean, looking at their form, uh, I didn't really have them on top. But there, you know, here we are, so to speak, and they are a real premiership threat so far through the first, uh, I guess, third uh, or quarter uh, of the season. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting. It's one of those I look at it and I go, "Are is Ross and his guys kind of kicking themselves because again, the Giants did everything that they 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 needed to do." Lockie Whitfield again, another fantastic game. As I agree with you, I think Jesse Hogan has found his niche at GWS, and when you're surrounded by a young young up and coming great full forward in Aaron Cadman. I think Joe, I think Riccardi has been fantastic for him. And then if you look at that midfield, I mean, it is star after star after star, Finn Callahan, Stephen Canelio. I mean, it's, I mean, just, just star after star is fantastic. Lockie Whitfield's back to his, his great dispo, just this distribution off of halfback. Sam Taylor is 
again, arguably the best fullback in the entire competition. I know he goes down in this game, but for them to be able to pull together and to pull this one out, that was a fantastic win. This is a Saints team I'm very intrigued by because I think they have the rep, they have the game style to make finals, but they got to keep games like this from getting away from them. And, and they also got to try to steal one against a better team. And they also got a really good break that Max King was not uh, as hurt as they feared that he was going to be mm -hmm. uh, with, with his knee. And then I know from uh, from watching all those Ross Lyon teams with Fremantle, he has a way of, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, making lemonade out of lemons. Not to say that the Saints roster is lemons, but I remember when he came to Fremantle again and that the roster or the list was not as strong as, as other teams in the competition, but he's a big believer in everyone playing their roles. And if everyone plays their roles, then magic can happen. And Ross still has that ability to, to call that and bring out the best in people, either by sheer terror uh, <laughs> that he can be sometimes or sheer belief and backing. So... Mm -hmm. You know, credit to him that he's got the Saints, um, uh, you know, marching uh, toward the uh, uh, toward finals as he as he hopes to have them. So that's going to be a really interesting thing. I know that they're they're a little slow going right now, number twelve on the ladder, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens the rest of the way. Yeah, still still a lot of footy still left to be played. I still think there's a lot of winnable gains for the Saints there. So we'll jump over to Marvel Stadium, and as you kind of addressed in your early thoughts, the fact that. The Adelaide Crows head over to Victoria and take down the undefeated Blues at the time. The no-win Crows, even, even more impressive, with a two-point win over the Blues, 198. And, and this is a fascinating game for me because this is a Crows team. There were so many question marks. Can they get it back? What's wrong with the Crows? Why can't they score like they scored last year? Is Tex Walker underdone? Is their defense too weak to be able to do that? Can they handle the Twin Towers up front? And by God, they found a way to do it. And sometimes you got to be better. You gotta, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. The Crows get a nice four-point win, and hopefully this gets them on the right track for their season. Well, Isaac Rankin really impressed me. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the last minutes, even though he missed a crucial shot, but he took a towering mark and he was always in the thick of everything. And, you know, Darcy Fogarty is another one that has a lot of talent and has uh, has a really strong leg on him like Tex Walker does. And, you know, there's a lot of depth that the Crows that the Crows have. And you could you could argue that the Crows were due for a win, that they weren't going to go the whole season winless. And um, they they did take advantage. I found them really smart. They played really smart and they could have given up. They really could have late in, in that uh, in that final term. But they didn't. And you, you got to praise their perseverance because they really came through when it counted and they seized on Carlton mistakes because Carlton really should have locked that that match away. Mm -hmm. Um and then it's it, footy is such a cruel game sometimes because one spilled mark can make a huge difference or one decision to go the dribble, as we saw, uh, can have disastrous effects. And uh, I was really amazed, too. How many shots did Charlie Kernel have in that match? I mean, my goodness, it was he took a ton of shots and he, and he probably it. wishes he had some of them back. So, you know, obviously, Carlton is the more talent based side as far as far as their list goes. But, uh, you know, it just it's, it's that old adage about how would you rather have a championship team or a team of champions? And it's the championship team for me every time. Mm -hmm. And so Carlton still shows that they, they have something to learn. And, um, and Adelaide, to me, uh, they, their veterans really were, were smart in, in how they approached it. And, um, you know, got to love the perseverance that they showed. And mm -hmm. and their jumpers, I really like their their uh, I like the crows jumpers. Mm -hmm. They're looking different, looking stylish. Yeah, have you have you actually have you chance have a chance to see their um I their Anzac Day good jumpers? They're absolutely fantastic. You get a chance to check those out. They're they're yeah. absolutely stunning. No, to I mean to go off and Charlie Colonel had seven shots on goals, four goals, three for this for yeah. this game and it's just it's just time it's just timely i mean if you look at it they go into the fourth quarter they are tied 75 75 and it literally is it's the behind that really really hurt i mean they go three goal they go three goals five in that final quarter where adelaide goes four goals one i mean that that is the difference right there yeah. it, it's just the accuracy going on goal and and the fact that the sub sam barry is the one that buries the last goal to, to end this yeah. one it, again. I'm I'm happy for the Crows because I, this was a team that has all these expectations this year. There was so much talk as this is the finals team. They fall short last year in, in dubious fashion. Again, I don't want to get into that, not just because I'm a Swans fan, because I don't think it's as cut and dry as everybody says. 
this is a Crows team with so much expectations. Everybody's talking about this is the finals team. If they can get the right run, maybe they can even be a premiership contender. We'll have to see. So for them to start as uh, ugly as they did, for them to find a way to get a win over a, a Carlton team that a lot of people starting to, starting to, it was there were eyeballs starting to move over to Carlton when it came to the premierships. So it'll be fascinating to keep an eye on this Crows team going forward. Unfortunately, we go from an absolute classic to an absolute dud as the Hawks get absolutely lambasted by the Gold Coast Suns, 109-56, a 53-point win. And you start to come to it. It's like, I know there's injuries at the Hawks, but this is another 50-plus point loss for the Hawks. I mean, I... I is is there trouble at the brown and gold in Melbourne right now because this is un Hawthorne like? Yeah, it really could be. I mean, Sam Mitchell must be tearing his hair out by now. I mean, you know, you you play on uh, that that uh, that uh, three peat club, uh, and it's funny. I happened to be at all three of those grand finals that the, that the Hawks won. Maybe I was their unwitting good luck charm or something. <laughs> uh, but anyway, no, he you know he was a, a crucial piece of that of that club. And, and now as the coach is, and it just must be something that must be frustrating him to no end because he knew nothing but success uh, with the Hawks and he knew it was a rebuild and all of that. Um, but Gold Coast, to me, that's a little intriguing situation. Took Miller, uh, great match for him. And then thinking about how much of Damian Hardwick's um, game style and, and mentorship is rubbing off on Gold Coast because there's, there's got to be all kinds of pressure on him to to bring the team to finals. I mean, he's been hailed as as uh, as a savior, mm -hmm. uh, and and Gold Coast, of course, have never made finals. And now, you know, they sit in the top eight right now. And will they still be there when uh, when all is said and done? When when the home and away season is done and dusted? Who knows? But um, yeah, you don't hear that too much. That that Gold Coast uh, laid waste to an opponent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nor unfortunately, it was usually the other way around. But again, it's yeah. you're already starting to you're already starting to see some some rumblings of some people going. I mean, it, are Hawthorne actually going in the right direction, or or have they have they strayed? And, and could it be longer than maybe a couple of years before we see? the Hawthorne Hawks start to maybe start creeping up the ladder. I think there was almost a little bit of fool's gold last year with a couple of later, later in the season wins over teams that were kind of shockers, including Collingwood that it's like, was it a little bit of fool's gold. We'll have, we'll definitely have to see. I'm, I'm fascinated on that one. Again, I think the sun's super talented. And, and like I said, I know the Hawks have some injuries, but 53 is that's a little excessive. I think it's the fact that Warpole, Newcomb and a lot of these midfielders didn't really fire a shot in this game. Like their midfield has been severely underperforming this year. And I think that's really hurting them because they're already hurting down back with so many injury with so many injuries. I mean, and their recruiting has brought in some forwards, but if the midfielders aren't giving them supply, there's not much they can do. And yep. there aren't too many in that forward line that can go back or into the midfield and make an impact. So it, what Sam yeah, Mitchell will do will be a major, major question mark as the rest of the season goes on. Is does he flip some magnets and try to see if he can find maybe a hidden gem in a different place? You know, wise old head, a wise old footy head from WA told me um, when I used to get excited about forwards and what they could do, and he was like, "Mate, uh, if you don't have midfielders that can deliver them the ball, what's the use?" And and that that really is uh, is a truism that's that's very important. Yeah, you gotta have you gotta have that supply because if they're not getting it, if the midfielders are not getting it, if there's no connectivity, then that is going to put the damper on all kinds of things. No, no matter who you have up forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one hundred percent agree. So we'll jump over to one as you said. You have a very big investment in us, the Dockers. Oh, do we? Do as we the have Dockers, to, nothing, Donnie? Do I will. I will <laughs> let you. I will let you have your cell box on this one. Port Adelaide beat the Dockers. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. By three, <laughs> at Adelaide Oval, as we said, the ground that shall not be named for some Fremantle supporters here. I mean. <laughs> Again, you're facing one of the best midfielders in the midfields in the entire in the entire competition in Butters, Rosie, and Horn Francis, who's starting to show why he was the number one pick a few years ago. And, and this is just a Port Adelaide team. They're clicking early in the season, which is a good sign for Kenny Hinkley's men. 
Yeah, and the one thing that we talked about with Adelaide, they found a way. They found a way to win, and Fremantle may not be exactly at that point yet because if you if you really think about what Port did, you know, Port were losing most of that match, and they did find a way at the end. Charlie Dixon, who was pretty fairly beaten by Alex Pierce, and so I, I would say mm-hmm. when you were talking about Sam Taylor, I really have to sing – Alex Pierce's praises as Luke Ryan's too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was really shutting down Charlie Dixon the whole match, but it's really interesting. And there's a baseball analogy to this Fremantle to me right now are the kind of team where it's like, if you followed really top pitchers, like a Jacob deGrom, who is a a former Met and I know his pitching really, really well, he'd go out and he'd throw gems all the time, but he never got run support. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what Fremantle are reminding me of right now, because the, the, you know, Fremantle are the number one defense in the competition Mm -hmm. as far as limiting teams to 63 points um, a match. But here's the, but the problem with that is that they almost have to play perfect footy in order to win. And they have to figure out a way to score more. Now, one thing that Mark Rusciuto said, uh, in the commentary that I thought was really off base and it showed that he doesn't know Fremantle as well as, as, uh, as the Fremantle supporters do was he was reckoning that if Fremantle were to go out in the off season and poach Logan McDonald from the Swans, which we both know is not going to happen, um, that they would be in, in a great position. But what he's forgetting is that when Sean Darsty is in there as the number one rock, we do uh, have a situation in Fremantle where Luke Jackson goes forward. And when Luke Jackson goes forward, that changes everything because then Jai Amos doesn't attract the number one defender in the back line. It frees him up to play a little higher up on the ground. He runs really well, and he's a really good lead-up target, whereas Luke Jackson and Josh Tracy are more of the crash-and-bash type types of guys who are mm-hmm. playing closer to the goal. And I think that really changes the complexion of things. It means that Matt Tabiner probably is going to spend a lot of time in the waffle if, uh, if Sean Darcy is fit and firing. But keeping Sean Darcy on the park has been really hard to do. And as Justin Longmuir says, he also likes to send uh, Sean Darcy up forward, too. So maybe the forward line is not so much the problem, um, but it's keeping everybody healthy that is. Because also in that match, I think Fremantle were missing the pace of Michael Frederick. And Mm -hmm. that was really important. And um, I really continue to be very impressed with Fremantle's back line and the midfield. Because the midfield matched Port's uh, pound for pound and actually outplayed them. I think moving Hayden Young into the midfield has been uh, a wonderful move. I would have done something a little bit different in terms of moving the magnets because one person for Fremantle that really had no effect at all was Michael Walters, and you have to get Michael Walters involved. I would have thrown him into the midfield for a little bit to get his hands on the ball, get him some touches, and he's a good kick, kicking inside 50. So I'm not sure why that wasn't done, and there have been in some quarters some criticism of him that he was barely cited. But, you know, sometimes uh, if you move the magnets around, it can increase uh, a player's uh, ability to affect the game. Josh Tracy, again, played what I thought was the match of his life. He kicked three goals in five minutes, took some strong contested marks, and, you know, he is really he's really here to stay. Port, though, you got to give them credit. Port came through when they had to. They they really did, and they uh, they Fremantle had the door open for them just long enough where they took advantage. And so Port, to me, uh, they showed the signs of being a top four side that they really found a way to get it done. And they've got that experience and the talent to do it. Yeah. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm going to 100% agree with you. Alex Pierce is one of those guys that I think if he's in Victoria, he's talked about just like Sam Taylor. I think it's because he's out West. It, it, it kind of hurts him a little bit, which again, it's disrespectful to some of these players that play interstate that if they're not in Victoria, they don't get talked about. I said, that's more on you for being so damn Victorian centric. That's on you. That's not on him. Again, Alex Pierce, I love the way he plays. He's been fan, absolutely fantastic this year. Uh, again, great defense and, and just there's just that connection, just that that accuracy going forward again i agree with you i don't think logan mcdonald gets poached because i really don't think the dockers need him like i'm i'm 100 with you i think the the jackson kind of unicornish kind of put anywhere on the ground i think will actually help out once sam darcy once sean darcy comes back which i'm anticipating and everything that i'm seeing he should be back this round for the derby which i think is a perfect game to bring him back in especially with all the talk of this week uh just it's one of the, again, poor, they're just clicking. I mean, Jason Hard Francis is an absolute matchup nightmare. I mean, he, he goes and gets and gets the winner in this one. Port's one of those I'm really going to keep an eye on because can they keep this form going? Because 
again, I just I'm fascinated by them because again, that midfield is probably one of the dangerous threes in the entire competition. We go from the absolute cracker to the absolute farthest thing from a cracker as the Geelong Cats, as you said, in a glorified training match against North, get a 75 point win, 139 64. Jeremy Cameron kicks six in this one. I mean, it, it's. <laughs> I hate bashing North. I don't want to do the pile on on North because I, I, there's talent, there's skill there. There's just something not right. And I don't know what it is. And I don't know if Clarko has any idea because he's throwing, he's throwing the proverbial, you know, what on the wall and hoping it sticks. And right now it's just not sticking. And I don't know what to do because his back line, his back line, he's so undersized and so inexperienced that no matter what forward line they face, they're in trouble. Their midfield, I love T- Tristan Jerry, but he's going up against he's going up against rucks that usually are going to beat him. He he does efforts all day long. It's fantastic, but it's just not working. I mean, Sheasel is fantastic on the halfback line. You'd love to have him in the mids, but right now they kind of need him as that distributor off halfback. And then after that, going forward, Larky's consistent, but he's not getting a lot of service so he's got to do damage when he does get it eddie ford's been fantastic curtis has had his moments it's just i i don't know what do you think because it's like again this is a cats team again one of the best in the absolute best in the competition there's a lot of people sleeping on them going into this year and they are they are per i mean i will use the pun the cats are purring right now well i think with north what you could have too is you have a bunch of guys who are uh, fairly new playing with each other and playing under a new system. And that, that can be, that can be really disastrous and they're really trying to find their feet. They're trying, I'm sure that there's also the pressure to try and please uh, the, the new coach and, uh, and trying to get it right in the system and also keep their spots. So you throw all that in the mix and they're not playing to, they, they don't appear as a side that's playing to win. They play they They seem to be the proverbial side that's playing not to lose. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, and again, for a team's confidence, that doesn't do anybody any good mm-hmm. when they're when they're playing that way. And uh, and Geelong just went out and pulverized them and it quickly became a glorified training run. Um, GTR, I, I, I guess, you know, in reference mm-hmm. to the old East band. But uh, uh, but yeah, so and, and Jerry McCameron's capable of kicking a big bag any any week. And he went out and did just that. And um yeah, it was it was not a good situation for for North at all, and uh, especially to play on the road in the house that Geelong have made so um, impe- impenetrable to mm-hmm. to most clubs. So yeah, they're 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 in serious trouble. North, I uh, don't know when I don't know when you can put a timetable on them turning it around. Alice, they're fighting or not. Yeah, it'll be interesting. This this week is the most is probably the most intriguing seventeen v eighteen matchup I've ever seen. I've ever seen in my life. But we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit later. Yeah. I'll jump to it. I know this isn't easy, sir, as a Fremantle supporter, but you gotta give your kudos. The West Coast Eagles off the shine oh, yeah. as they knock off the rich the uh, Richmond Tigers. But I'm gonna be one hundred percent honest with you. This for me is it's great for West Coast. I'm glad they got a win. I know they've they've went through all of this, but this is a Richmond team. They are being held together by duct tape and spit. Mm-hmm. I mean, so many injuries. You lose Toronto to a broken wrist. Balta's out. Lynch is out. Presti is out. Ross is out. I mean, this is literally. I feel horrible for Uze because I mean, literally, there's not much that he can do. This is most of these things are happening completely out of his control again harley reed magnificent great to see elliot yo back i mean he'd had he's had so many seasons where he's been inconsistent because he's been hurt and he's not been on the park so to see him kind of and and i don't mean to say it this way but almost taking inspiration from harley reed and coming up with another fantastic performance it's great to see the eagles playing well they get the win 109 70 a 39 point win but this is again Harley Reed, fantastic. It shows why he was the number one overall pick. I really think the Western Australians are hugging this young man and they want him to stay because I think you've got the guy that could help lead them into the future. They're starting to get youth into this team a little bit. They've kind of moved out the old guard from the 2018 grand final. You're starting to see it. 
But again, I put a tiny asterisk on this because you beat a Richmond team that this is not the Richmond team that beat Sydney a few weeks ago with Balta and Lynch and some of their best players on the park. Shy Bolton, again, magnificent performance. The guy is playing absolutely fantastic football, but even he can't overcome the fact of so many, I mean, the Swiss cheese nature of this, of this Richmond team. Well, yeah, not only that, but, you know, the Tigers got off to a blistering start. Mm-hmm. And, you you know, you really thought the Tigers are going to run away with it. But, you know, you have to give credit where credit is due and, you know, rivalries aside. Um, you know, Fremantle, just to, just to um, touch on the Derby, they better not underestimate West Coast. Mm-hmm. They're going to be in serious trouble if they do. Um, Justin Longner is already thinking about possibly putting a tagger on Elliot Yo. He had that great an inf- impact on the match. Mm-hmm. And then who could have foreseen Waterman coming out of nowhere to kick six? Mm-hmm. I mean, that was, <laughs> I mean, who, nobody saw that coming. And then Harley Reed, uh, it was it was really one of the first times I've had a chance to to look at Harley Reed the whole match. And he really he really looks the goods. He really does. He's got the mature age body already. Um, he's also unafraid to mix it up. Uh, with with veterans, he he doesn't seem like he's easily intimidated, and uh, he really paces that side. And I think you're right about uh, inspiring some of the veterans, where the veterans get that youthful energy, and they they get that going. So West Coast obviously played played its best match of the season, and um, and give them a lot of credit because they they could have folded their tent after the first term. They really could have. They were not mm-hmm. off to a, they were off to a terrible start, and they fought back and won handily. So. Um, you know, again, this is something where if I think if you're a Fremantle supporter, you have to be a little wary uh, going in, even though Fremantle have won the last five derbies and that this is a West Coast side that just got its first win. But, you know, you, anything can happen in footy and you cannot underestimate an opponent. Mm-hmm. 100% agree with you. Like, there's this is the round like I'm literally, I'm literally looking at I'm looking at the fixture this round and I'm I'm sitting here going there really is not a game that I'm going yeah, I'm not that interested in it because there, there's intrigue in almost every single matchup this round. So we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more when we get the tips. But I, I literally I'm scrolling through each one and, and all eight matchups this round have something that I'm going. Ooh, I cannot wait to watch this. So it'll, it'll be it'll be magnificent. Looking forward to that round. So we'll jump to it. We've been through all eight games. We go through to the burning questions. Some of the questions. And, and we kind of, we tease this a little bit, but I want to discuss this. I mean, it is on everybody's mind and that is the MRO because I'm, I don't know about you, sir, but I'm, I'm starting to get to the point. I, I agree with the media. And again, I don't always like joining the media because sometimes I think they have some takes that are just wildly inconsistent. The suspensions, I, I'm just I, I, I'm not understanding some of them because there's some that I'm thinking absolute locks for a suspension that are getting let off. And there's ones that are, I mean, I'm thinking two to three weeks that only get around. So, I mean, your thoughts, cause I, I'm, are they inconsistent? Is the inconsistency of the MRO getting to fans because of the fact you don't know what the MRO is going to say is a suspension and what isn't. Well, the one consistency is the inconsistency of the MRO. I mean, you know, what would a footy season be if there were not controversial decisions and non-decisions that the MRO are, are, are taking here? I thought the MRO was very bold in its handling of the um, of the Finlayson incident. Uh, I mean, that's unprecedented mm-hmm. um, to to suspend a player for the amount of time for a homophobic slur and to have that player uh, take a workshop and. Um, and and have it be not only punitive but but educational. So I think that's that's in one sense. But you know it's interesting. There's some things that are really borderline. The Bailey Banfield incident with mm-hmm. with, uh, with Connor Rosie. Um, I've looked I looked at that several times, and you mm-hmm. can really make the case that he was going for the ball. That Connor Rosie was truly going yep. for the ball and was not leading with his head or looking to put a hurt on on Bailey Banfield. I don't have any problem with him not getting. Uh, suspended in in that one. Um, the really contentious thing that I think has to happen here, or or the really contentious thing, is the sling tackling, the dangerous tackling, because it seems like so much of the time now, players are going to the WWE body slam tackles, which I don't understand because it didn't, it wasn't that prevalent, at least not to me, mm-hmm. maybe five to ten years ago. But it just seems like now with tackling, either the players are not being taught right, or 
players for whatever reason are seeking to put some exclamation mark on the tackle, which they don't have to do. Because mm -hmm. it's interesting, when I explain footy to, uh, to American kids, I always say that the purpose of a tackle is not to restrict the movement of a player. It's to restrict the ability to dispose of the football. Mm -hmm. That's the big difference, right? So I, I really don't understand why so many guys uh, are, are now – thinking that what they have to do to tackle is either lift someone up off the ground or take a player and slam them so that their head hits, hits, hits on their side. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the things that really, um, that need to be punished more, more than anything, because, you know, that's risking uh, a player's livelihood right there mm -hmm. um, with their heads and with possible concussion and, and all that. Um, so, yeah, that, and it's funny how you're seeing that more often these days than what you used to see about the jumper punches and, and you know, the gut punches and things like that, which you don't see that much of or as much of as you used to. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, you're all, I think that is always going to happen. They're always, and, and I hate to say this, but maybe the league might want it that way that you have some contentious decisions and non decisions because it keeps the debate going. It keeps, you know, it, it you know, it, just like journalism, you know, the, the, the airing of public debate and public opinion, and it and it really is great mm -hmm. fodder for talk radio and all of that stuff. Well, I for me, it's one of those that I, I see everybody comparing the crouch hit on the Carlton player and the band and and the butters on Banfield hit, and for me personally, and and I'll go on this and, and see what you think on this. I understand crouch being suspended because crouch goes for the bump not mm -hmm. for the footy like everybody's like he's going for the footy no he's not if you actually look at it his arm is into his chest and he full-on bumps a guy in a reckless way in it and i understand it, it, with both of the with both of these particular incidents both the carlton to player and bailey banfield they technically take really really bad um efforts to try to get the ball because carlton the guy go leads with his head trying to go over the ball and Banfield is stretching mm -hmm. as he, as he kind of fumbles it. So neither is in a really great place to take a bump. So I understand the arguments of, well, Banfield's head gets hit. Yes. But technically, even if you slow that down, I honestly believe there's a little bit of contact on Banfield's chest first, which actually yeah. makes his first contact. Uh, just the tiniest bit, uh, just the tiniest bit uh, less than what it would have been at full speed. So, yeah, and you never want to see anybody get hurt. But you, I think, and it's interesting because when you look at so many things that happen in footy, the things are punished on the result rather than the intent because no one really can read intent. Where I think in in North American sports, so much of it is intent when when things are are punished, and I think that's a major difference between the two between the uh, two sporting codes and the two continents. Um, but yeah, I think in this one, I didn't see anything sinister in, in Connor Rosie on, on Bailey Banfield. I mean, I really think he was honestly going for the ball. And um, I think that, you know, that's done and dusted. That's that. Yeah. 100% agree with you. All right. We are back. We had to take a tiny bit of a break. So we have a little bit of a location change from here. So we will jump now to the next question in the burning questions and that is what i think a lot of people would have to talk about and that is the fact that the cats are five and oh so are you surprised by the five and oh start by the hoops with no danger and no cam guthrie both on the on the sidelines with injury yeah i mean who wouldn't be i mean right you, you just hit on the reasons why especially danger uh you know riding off into the sunset and, and all of that yeah that is really really Wow, that that's crazy. I don't think a lot of people would have had them there because people kept talking about how old the cats were getting and how stale they were and all of that. And then look at them, five and zero. Oh, um, that is really something. And you know, shout out to uh, uh, a, a new friend of mine who I met in Indonesia recently, who's a big cat supporter, Andrew Parkin down there. He's got even the name Parkin, you know, so he's he's got that classic name. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I know he's proud of the cats. I know the 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 fans in Geelong are going crazy for them right now. And um, with the rebuilt, with the totally now refurbished GMHBA stadium. And um, yeah, there, there, there's some good times ahead. If they can hold on. Uh, yeah. They absolutely could do some damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm 100% with you. And the scary part is, as, as they said, both danger and Guthrie will be back 
not in in the near future like within the next few rounds i think you could see both of the both of those absolute superstars back but it's for me it's the fact you have bows you have bruin you have parfit you have dempsey you have some of the just kind of scratch players like you're not 100 sure just absolutely playing fantastic football yes you've got your superstars you've got your stewards you've got you've got your cameras you've got your hawkins you've got your Brian myers you've got the guys that they're gonna put butts in seats but it's it's the it's the it's the guys that you're not 100 sure about having absolute belting seasons right now tyson stengel coming back into that form that he had when they won the premiership back in 2022 was, you still don't have you be, also yeah. still don't have gary rowan either gary rowan yeah. is still sitting on the sideline so this is the cats team i said it i said in my preview i said i think the cats make finals this year i think last year was a little bit of a lot of injuries you played later in the year i think you were still kind of finding a way to kind of deal with the selwood retirement i think it was was something that they were still trying to figure out and just they had injury after injury they just had no in they had very inconsistent play this is a cats team i think they make finals are they a premiership favorite I'm still not 100% sure. Again, I look at I look at who they I look at who they beat at least by records. The Saints should be a finals competitor, but when you have wins over Hawthorne, you have wins over North Melbourne and the Western Bulldogs, it kind of steps it back just the tiniest bit. But I still think with the with the firepower that this Cats team has, they're going to be a dangerous dangerous side, especially this round going up against Brisbane. That's going to be one heck of a game up at the gala. Yeah. So, and and lest anyone think I was writing Patrick Dangerfield off when I said ri riding off into the sunset, um, but I really think that uh, wouldn't it be great for him uh, if he rides off into the sunset with a premiership? That would be mm -hmm. something to really think about. And I kind of get a little nostalgic too because I remember um, attending Danger's first match as a cat. Um, at the MCG on Easter Monday against uh, against Hawthorne, and it was it was a fantastic match. And um, you know, Danger has been a great two club player, and uh, you you just can't write off a side that is uh, that that's not that far removed um, from from a premiership. You just you just can't you can't do that. I mean, uh, I think those who do are foolish too, because mm -hmm. they didn't end up premiers by accident. They, they just didn't. And they have uh, a lot of experience and that experience can come in, you know, very handy at times. It really, really can. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting. So I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this next one. I know we're only five games into the season as I ask this question. So please take it with a grain of salt a little bit, but I'll have some fun with this. Okay. I want to take. I want you to take out your crystal ball. I want. I want you to go into the recesses of your mind, and I want you to pull how, into how the future. My, my, how about the snow globe? Can I do that? <laughs> That'll work. That'll work. The snow globe of the Golden Gate Bridge. We have eight sides right now that sit in the finals of GWS, Geelong, Port Adelaide, Sydney, Melbourne, Carlton, Fremantle, and the Gold Coast. Hmm. Are these the eight sides that we will see contending for the flag in the finals? And if not all eight, what teams do you see falling out and who do you see replacing them? Okay, well, I'm going to go for the low-hanging fruit first. <laughs> the low-hanging okay. fruit, and, and, and Suns fans don't get mad at me about this, but, you know, you look you look at the Suns, they're still young, they're still learning the new system under Damian Hardwick. It's hard for me to really believe that Gold Coast are going to be in the top eight and Collingwood will not be in the top eight. So, that would be the one thing that I would look to automatically, uh, you know, right, right out of the gate. Um, Melbourne, I think a little dubious Melbourne. It, it might not completely surprise me to see them drop out and perhaps Brisbane uh, insert themselves into the top eight, because as you mentioned before, I mean, Melbourne are having some, some issues with their forward line. And you mentioned that there's not a lot of firepower to compensate for that. You know, you look at someone like a Christian Petraka, who wins uh, incredible numbers of clearances, but he's not the most accurate kick. In a way, he's kind of remind, reminiscent to me of Nat Fife. The fact that he's very, very good at, at um, or excellent, in, in elite even, at a few things. But Nat Fife's kicking has always let him down. And Christian Petraka's kicking has also let him down. And there, there's still some fallout and disarray from the whole thing with Clayton Oliver. And uh, I would not be surprised at all if Melbourne are the club to drop out and Brisbane are the club to jump back in. 
Um, looking at the other sides, I think that what you talked about with Geelong, we talked about, about Geelong, I don't see them dropping out of the top eight. GWS, I think, are too talented and have such a great, strong youth core. I don't see them dropping out of the top eight. Port, I think, will definitely be there. Um, Sydney, I I can see sort of sort of toward the lower end of the uh, lower end of the eight, but I think they're going to be there. Uh, I don't know for whatever reason. Um, some commentators have, have mentioned that they don't think Sydney are that strong. I think they're doing just fine right now. Uh, I mean, they're sitting fourth. You, you can't can't go too much better than that. Um, and I think that Carlton and Fremantle. I do think that those two sides are going to be in the top eight. I definitely mm -hmm. do. I think Fremantle. Uh, I think those two matches against Adelaide and Port, and I'm sorry, not Adelaide, against Carlton and Port Adelaide, yeah, they were heartbreakers. They really were. Mm -hmm. But I do think that with some young clubs like that being battle tested and going through those heartbreaks, and I hate to be cliche, but thinking about learnings uh, from those matches, I think it's going to make Fremantle a better side mm -hmm. uh, in the long run. Carlton, I think, uh, are really, really powerful in the addition of Sam Walsh back into the side is only going to do wonders for them. They'll have learned from their mistakes against against Adelaide, and they were due for a loss anyway. Mm -hmm. So those are the clubs that I really can see being in the top eight. I really don't – I don't really think – I wouldn't count on St. Kilda and Essendon, certainly not the Bulldogs, um, and neither the Crows nor the Tigers, as you've talked about, or, or West Coast, Hawthorne, or North. So I, I do think we're going to see a couple of changes within the top eight by mm -hmm. the end of the home and away season. See, and for me, I, I'm I'm pretty much with you. My 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 biggest question would be is the, here's my caveat with Fremantle, is if Darcy comes in, can Jackson make that impact that I I believe that you believe can happen? If it does, absolutely Fremantle stays because defensively we're one of the best defenses in the entire competition. Defense wins championships. That's definitely how you go. But if the Jackson move forward and Darcy staying in the rock doesn't work, that could spell trouble because it, it'll, it'll throw a lot of things off. You can be great defensively, but if you can't score, then yeah. you almost have to be perfect defensively and there's, it's physically impossible for them to be perfect. I well, agree let, with let you. I think that, so, Johnny, let me, let me just jump in a little bit. No, here. go ahead. Okay. And I'm not saying this to be a one-eyed supporter, but I think that the person that really could make the biggest impact is Jai Amos, not mm -hmm. necessarily Luke Jackson, because I, I think uh, Jackson does a great job when he's up forward. I think the really interesting thing that Luke Jackson might bring to the table is just the ability to take the pressure off Amos and to take the pressure off Josh Tracy. Mm -hmm. And if, if Jackson doesn't fire, well, I think, I think again, it frees Amos to take on the second defender mm -hmm. and play a little bit higher up on the ground. Um, and don't under underestimate the speed of, of Michael Frederick. And then also, too, a recent development that just happened today, Jordan Clark, who either beat himself up or didn't beat himself up, mm -hmm. uh, yelling at himself against Carlton in that match, he just got a contract extension through 2028. And, you know, he's having a sensational start to the season because one of the things that I notice is a big improvement in Fremantle is getting the ball out of their D50 and going on the offensive. And they've been really markedly improved on that. I've been impressed with how much they are going and using the corridor because they didn't used to do that. They used to be very predictable, kick long down the line. But I also am impressed with the way their defense is taking away the corridor from other clubs. That's what I think is really going to help them in, in, in the long run uh, over the course of the season. I think they're going to surprise some teams. Mm -hmm. And when Darcy is back in there, I think it's really going to help for, for a lot of reasons. If for no other reason, just to create new matchups down, uh, or I should say up forward. Mm -hmm. No, 100% agree with you. Like actually for me, I agree with you. Like I don't, I'm not as iffy on Fremantle as some. I'm actually going to throw one that I think may shock some people. I think it's Carlton. It's because of their injuries right now. Sod going down, McGovern going down. That's two of their better halfback players. Your intercept possession and your ball moving that can really throw a defense off. Jacob Weedering again, another great fan, a, a fantastic fullback. Nick Newman has done has done wonders back there for Carlton ever since he's done the Navy Blue coming down from Sydney. But that's a dangerous combination because it means that you're very very. It's your vulnerable going 
defensively. And Carlton sometimes can be inconsistent and Makai and Kerno can take games off. So I'm one of those, if these injuries stack up like they are, and the fact that I love Sam Walsh, but Walsh is one of those one hit just right. And he may be back on the sidelines again, which is a little terrifying. I think it's Gold Coast and Carlton. Melbourne's there, but I think defensively, if Lever and May can stay healthy, I think they can scratch themselves enough, scratch out enough wins. I think they can make it. So for me, right now, and again, a good huge caveat, we're still plenty of this. Right now, it's Gold Coast and Carlton that I think are the two weakest. I'm with you. I think it's Collingwood and Brisbane are the two teams right now out that I think could come in. Collingwood will be, can they figure themselves out? system wise because they just have not looked the same again i know they gone all the way to the finals it's going to take a little bit of time but collingwood does not look like collingwood and and i know it's too simplistic to say it but they have not looked themselves these this entire season they do have their win or two wins but they haven't exactly been what i was expecting again and then with brisbane i think it's one of those they're a great team. I think I think they've just they've kind of they got stuck in neutral early in the year. They got nipped a little bit by Carlton, who I think kind of surprised them a little bit. Again, when you've got the three-headed monster of Charlie Cameron, Eric Hipwood, and Danaher, if they're on, they're incredibly difficult to stop. So I am with you. Right now, I like I said, I would say is Gold Coast and Carlton dropping out just because of the injury trouble at Carlton with Brisbane and Collingwood stepping in i'm with you i think the top four top five stay in and i think Fremantle stays so six of the eight for me so and i have a question for you please when you were talking because i i totally feel you when you're talking about collingwood not looking like collingwood so donnie what do you do you think that there may be some premiership hangover going on do you think that uh maybe they've they've maybe the urgency has dropped off a little bit or or is it uh I mean, what? I mean, they they totally do not look like the same Collingwood that. Um, or, or here's another thing. You know, there's so much adrenaline that they played on last season. They won mm-hmm. so many close matches, right? How long can a can a club keep living on the edge like that mm-hmm. and sustaining that and I'm, keeping the intensity? I'm 100 percent with you. I I've said it early in the season. I think the hunger for some of their players that need to play with hunger like they did last year, it's gone. Like they've, their bellies are full. They got that. They got their title. And so it's very difficult to step up and do it again. Like, and as they said, two years in a row now, they've played the comeback kids. They were the team that could never like every single time, James Brayshaw, there's eight minutes left and they're down 20. Well, you know, Collingwood has a propensity of coming back. And this year, it's just never materialized. I think Dake, I think Dakos has been exposed a little bit in the midfield. I think he needs to be off the halfback line. I think he's much more effective, not in the guts, but coming off that halfback line. I think to go, I think to has lost a little bit of hunger. I know I, I thought it was fascinating that in the one game, they showed the fact that him and to and somebody were giving each other a high five as the ball was streaming down the far wing all the way. And then led to a goal a, a team that's hungry and wants to win, they're not going to congratulate themselves as the ball's skipping down player by player to go for another goal. So this is a Collingwood team that I questioned their, I, I said it early in the season, they've, they've tipped a couple of, the, they've, they've, they've showed it just in glimpses of that hunger, that, that all out, we're not going to give up type of mentality but they're yeah. just not showing it consistently. And I think teams in the league have figured out how to disrupt them. Like Brisbane did last year, like a couple of teams is forcing them to turn the ball over in the midfield leaves them extremely exposed down the back. And unfortunately we'll cover it now. Nathan Murphy, again, I, I tip my cap to you, sir. I know that's not an easy decision. I know that the decision was taken out of your hands, congratulations on a hell of a career you do leave as a premiership player that's one thing that they can take out of it i think they miss him a little bit because he kind of helped balance what was happening with darcy moore back there with jeremy howell and with some of that he's destabilized this back line a little bit i know they finished through the grand final a little bit i think it's one of those they were able to do it but as the season goes on 
you can tell Darcy Moore is a little off because he had Nathan Murphy as that helper. He doesn't have them this year. How has not kind of been the same. So this is a Collingwood team. Nothing has really clicked yet. Yeah. And and yeah. if you're not a Collingwood supporter, in the back of your mind, you're going, I hope to God it does it. For the for the footy coverer, for the person that covers footy, I kind of want to see if they do. Because if they do, holy shnikes, that makes things even more interesting. But if they don't, could we even see for the second straight year a defending premier not make the finals? I mean, Collingwood is strong enough skill wise. I'm, I'm kind of leaning on that. I think they'll figure it out. But if they don't, yeah, this could be a very long year for the for the black and yeah, white. Yeah, yeah. And then sometimes teams uh, are too complacent, thinking, "Well, we will figure it out. It's mm-hmm. just going to happen." And they look to the next man, and they look to the next man, and no one has the answer. Yep. And you know, one of the things in in North American sports again that I think that that we forget sometimes. I mean, Nathan Murphy is what twenty four years old, mm-hmm. but been in the system for what six years, and mm-hmm. that's such a big difference with North American sports. And so I hope for for his sake, uh, you know, as a twenty four year old uh, young man, I mean, he's in, in life and footy, he may be um, not getting up there, but hitting his prime. But in in the grander scheme of life, I mean, he's a baby, twenty four, and you just mm-hmm. hope that. He has uh, a lot of good, uh, good productive years and doing whatever he's going to do the rest of his life ahead of him. 100%. No, he's, he's a premiership player. No one can take that away from him. Yep. And, and, and like I said, and he made that call. Like he could have, like, from what I've heard, the scat test, he could have went back in, but he told the, he told the, the physios that he didn't think he should go back out there. And that's why they, they, they made the substitution again. Yep. Like I said, I'm I'm not I'm not one of these people that I that I hate Collingwood. In fact, I, I find Collingwood fascinating. Like I I thoroughly enjoy watching them because they are such this helter skelter team this year. Like I want them. Like there, there's part of me like there's 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 the Sydney side Sydney fan in me that wants them to not find it and to miss finals to kind of humble the fan base a little bit. And then there's the footy cover the footy coverage type of person that, that, that covers it that. I love the intrigue of a team that you know can never be counted out until right. all three zeros hit. So I'm fascinated. The Pies are the team outside of the eight that have me the most intrigued um, completely. Essendon's another one that I look and I go, what are you? Like the, mm-hmm. the oh, Essendon edge stuff with Sydney. And then the next week there was none of it. And then they kind of, it, sprinkled back in over the next couple of rounds, but hey, I, I don't know. So just There's a few teams that I'm just, I'm kind of just, I'm not 100% sure about. Again, we're only five games in for most teams. So I'm. And they haven't I, found their true identity. There's some, there's exactly. some clubs out there that, that are searching for that, uh, you know, for, for that identity. I think that's something that, um, you know, I watched happen with Fremantle for many years, not really having a, a complete knowing what kind of club they are. Mm-hmm. And yep. I think that's, I think you alluded to it earlier. I think that's what we're seeing at North. I think that's what we're seeing at Hawthorne, um, you know, and then there are clubs that are trying to take on uh, a new culture, a new identity like Gold Coast. I mean, mm-hmm. anytime you get a, a premiership coach like Damian Hardwick uh, that has to to perk you up a little bit as a supporter and as a player that, Hey, you know, this person knows how to win and they're coming from a winning club and they can inject that here mm-hmm. or try and inject it here. Yeah. So that's going to be very interesting to watch. All right, we'll have we'll have some fun. I always end the burning questions. If I know somebody is a huge supporter of something, I got to ask a question. So as the Dockers man that you are, I have to ask, you've had a couple of rocky rounds. I know I'm not trying to bring back PTSD issues here. I'm not trying to do it. <laughs> but I got to ask, are there concerns of a downturn for the season or do you see the Derby potentially being a turning point for this young Dockers list? Well, it's interesting because last week I really I posted this on social media that I thought that a win over Port could be a season-defining win. Um, I think what the Dockers do have to do now, and pardon the pun, is get a win to right the ship. Mm-hmm. Um, there, it's a little bit of a soft patch through the next, with the exception of Sydney, um, who the next four matches are are against. Um, but I do see the Dockers rebounding this. I think I might feel more confident if this were a home derby right now than an away derby because the Eagles are coming off a really confidence-building round. And the Dockers cannot – and they just cannot afford to underestimate West Coast at this point. However, getting Sean Darcy back, getting Michael Frederick back, 
I think will be enough to to buoy them. Boy, I'm I'm using all the nautical metaphors here, aren't I? And, and <laughs> I love it. All this other stuff, but you know the thing that um that I think is gonna is gonna help here is that in the past, and I think the Dockers players have admitted this themselves, is that there are matches that uh, were they were behind. I mean, the first quarter has been notoriously bad for Fremantle over the last few years. And having watched them, I really could totally see them dropping matches against even that first round one against Brisbane and um, uh, a, a couple of the, in, even in a couple of the wins, them, them really folding their tents. But I don't see that this year. I, re- I think this is a very different Fremantle side from what I'm used to seeing. I think that they're not afraid to take those risks, and that's what I really admire about them when they're exiting their defensive 50 using the corridor and not being, and even if they mess up going and using the corridor, they'll still go to it again. But the thing that's surprising me a little bit too is the kick mark game, uh, which I didn't used to see really f- from them, but I think it's a lot smarter. I think the players are playing with a lot more composure. And I think this one can be a real confidence builder for Fremantle to reestablish them as a team. Hey, we know we're good. We know we are capable of making finals. And all it just takes is a steadier. And I think I would look at this match as a steadier. However, it could go completely south if they underestimate West Coast. Yeah, definitely. It'll be it'll be interesting. That that's a West Coast. That's a that's a derby that I'm I'm extremely looking forward to. Cannot wait for that. So we're finished with the burning questions, and we kind of go to the part where Coach takes over the podcast just the tiniest bit just because i gotta i gotta get in some things here gotta have some fun so we'll go to my team of the week um and we'll, we'll run through this really quickly again as a coach i start with defense and the full back lines we see melbourne's jake lever geelong's tom stewart and as an homage to you Fremantle's alex pierce in the full back line the half back line sees essendon's nick martin geelong's max holmes and norse harry sheasel out on the wings, we see Xavier Dersma of the Essendon Bombers and Gold Coast Sam Closty. Two weeks in a row, Sam has made it on there. He's been a wonder for the wings for the Gold Coast Suns. In the centers, we see Hugh McCluggage of the Brisbane Lions, Gold Coast Noah Anderson, and West Coast Elliot Yo. In the ruck, sees Max Gone. At the half forward line, sees Charlie Kerno of the Carlton Blues. Shy Bolton of the Richmond Tigers and Geelong's Jeremy Cameron. Full forward line sees the West Coast, um, Waterford and uh, Jacob Waterford, Adelaide's Tax Walker, and Gold Coast Ben King. On the bench, my defender is GWS's Lockie Whitfield. My ruck is the old veteran. Hottie Goldstein of the Essendon of the Essendon Bombers in the midfield sees St. Kilda's Brad Hill of the St. Kilda Saints and Norse Eddie Ford is my forward on the bench. Just really quickly, your thoughts on that team of the week. Well, you could have paid real homage to me and stuck Luke Ryan in there too. I mean, I come thought on. he Luke, did he Luke did Luke really Ryan well, but the halfback an... line the halfback line I ran into is that Martin Holmes and Sheasel all had really good games. It was really hard to fight that to fight that one there. I I I had Luke, I think Luke was one of the last ones that as I was going through my analytics was the one that I, I chopped off. He I I agree with you. Fantastic game again. Fremantle again. Fantastic defensively. <laughs> Well, and then, but, but Waterman though was is, is just you know that's just uh, falling from the sky that mm-hmm. just no one no one could have seen coming, yep. um, you know, and, and and good on him for uh, uh, for for kicking a bag uh, last week. But yeah, I mean those, those are those are very very solid picks. Uh, it's it's hard to, it's hard to argue with them for sure. Yeah, I I try like I said, it's always kind of fun because some some of the people that I've had on have, have come up with a few and I'm like, ooh, that's a good that's a good shout. I absolutely love it. So and then about the only thing happening only good thing happening with my fantasy team, which I've been, you know, a little <laughs> a little bit neglectful of with a lot on, but but you know, I remember you praised my pick in, in your league when I did pick Goldstein. I, I said that if 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 um if if they're regular if if the the long haired I can't even remember his name right off the top of my head right now. Oh, Draper, Sam Draper. If Dra- if Draper had any issues that Goldstein would Goldstein would have probably played just to save some Goldstein's leg and he, I think he's played really well. I Goldie has has done really well. It's really weird seeing him in the red sash. I have to be honest. I'm so yeah. used to the white the blue and white, but he's he's been fantastic. So and then we will jump now to the power range. 
rankings we've done through round five. Every single team has played five games. So we'll go to the power rankings. And this kind of stays a little bit to the latter. Just one tiny difference. In the five spot, we see the Carlton Blues, a close loss um, to Adelaide. It's just a little bit stronger than Melbourne's um, bigger loss to the Brisbane Lions. Sydney at four. The Port Adelaide Power at three. The Geelong Cats at two. And at the top, just like on the ladder, GWS is the number one on the power rankings. So we got to it. We are to the point that I absolutely love. We are T minus probably only about six hours away or six or seven hours away from the first round of the next round. So Gil, oh let's goodness. let's do some let's do some tips. Let's take a look at this absolutely scintillating round. And the first one sees an intriguing one at Marvel Stadium as the St. Kilda Saints take on the doggies. Can Ross lead a win or can the doggies right the ship after a rocky week in, in on the sidelines? Who do you like in this one? I like St. Kilda to smash them. Uh, I, I, I really do. And I have to admit, this is kind of weird, but I don't get as excited for matches where for all intents and purposes, it's like a home match for both clubs because they share the same facility. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, it would be so, you know, I have been out to, I know I'm totally going off topic here, but, but I've been <laughs> out to, to, to Footscray and, you know, and I, I've been to, the, I've been to the ground out there and it would, and I guess the romantic in me wishes somehow they could refurbish that ground out in Footscray with, mm -hmm. with, with Teddy Witten Oval with the statue out there and play their matches out there. It's, it's a really nice place if they could only do that. But anyway, I digress. I, I think the Bulldogs are really in disarray right now. The saints will really be very hungry and I'll use a loss, a Ross Lion, a loss, a Ross Lion expression, something that uh, he loved to say. You know, he said, oh, yeah, you know, they're dog hungry. You know, when he, we would talk about uh, free mail, talk about the Saints. So I think the Saints are definitely going to be dog hungry. And I, I really would look for them to smash the Western Bulldogs in this one. I'm not sure if I see a smashing because I think there's enough talent on the Bulldogs that I think they'll keep it closer. But I'm with you. I think the Saints are on a lot better mojo. I think that game against the GWS is one of those honorable losses. Again, I know some people hate that term, but I'm one of those. Sometimes when you lose against a really good team in a close fashion, it's something that you can take out of it. So I am with you. I have the saints in this one. I think it's a little bit closer. I think it's under three goals. I th I think the doggies stay in it. Just Jamaro Hagen, you've got Bontempelli, you've got Trelore, you've got some game changers in that one. I don't think this one's going to get away from the doggies on this one. All right, over to the Adelaide Oval as the Crows look to extend the one game win to maybe two as they take on the Essendon Bombers. I like the Crows in this one. They're at I home. Do too. They I play do too. really well there. And I yeah. think the Bombers defensively, they're still a little shaky for me. They're a little bit too inconsistent. I liked Isaac Rankin go through the center. I think the Crows match up really well. I like the Crows in this one. I absolutely do too. I think that uh, last round that is that's a that is a potential season turnaround win, and I think mm -hmm. that uh, I, don't, I don't know if the I still don't have the pros finishing in the top eight, but I think that this potentially could be something that really can help uh, put their season back on course. And of course, you know, with Essendon struggling, I I really think that uh, that Adelaide uh, would would get the chocolates here. Yeah, it'll be fast. That that's that one's going to be a very intriguing one, and, and just as intriguing one Saturday afternoon footy at the G as the Collingwood Magpies host the Port Adelaide Power. Can the Power avenge a whooping? The, one of the last times they went over to the G, or can the Pies start to find their mojo and get it going? Who do you like in this one? I like the Pies finding their mojo in this one. Uh, I think that there has got to be a time when the Pies are going to say, okay. Enough is enough. Let's it, it's Collingwood time. Uh, I know my friend Paige Cardano will be very happy to hear that. She's the biggest pie supporter supporter I know. So Paige, shout out to you if you uh, check out this podcast. I see Collingwood coming back with a vengeance in this one. Port did not do all that much to uh, to avert, uh, or or they could have very easily lost to Fremantle. Um, and they need to find themselves. They need to really find a find another gear. And I think that Collingwood will get the wood on them. I'm one of those, I'm going to tip the pies, but this is one that, this is a danger game for the pies because you're at home. This is one you got to win. This is one, 
I would also say too, if this one was over at the Adelaide Oval, I'd probably tip the power just because I think the pies travel, but Adelaide, Port Adelaide play really well at home, not as strong on the road. Pies at home at the MCG. I know it's an afternoon game. I think the Pies win this one, but this is close. I think the strength of their midfield keeps them in the game. This will not shock me if if the Power win this one, but I'm going to tip the Pies on this one. Hey, one what? other thing about Port I forgot to mention, Don. This is how the footy gods mess I, I, I well mess <laughs> with me, right? I'm in the grocery store the other night. I'm in a you know I live in a small town here in California, and what song? Should come over the loudspeaker after this never loss. Never tear us apart. I know. Never tear us apart. <laughs> okay, you know that's I'm, cruel. You, you, cruel. You, you really have to rub this in. Now, now take <laughs> nothing away from NXS. I love NXS. They ruled 1988. That song, you know, is a fantastic song and everything. But did I really need to hear that when I'm shopping for asparagus? And you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and hear them hear this going on. I didn't need it. And after oh. the gut wrenching loss too, oh, yeah. that one's got to yeah. hurt. But it's it, life's little moments there for sure. All right, well, we'll jump down from the G to Marvel Stadium in what I think is a fascinatingly, fascinatingly intriguing game as Carl as Carlton hosts the GWS Giants. Both teams a little wounded coming into this one. The question yeah. is whose wounds are a little bit deeper. I'm going to tip the Giants in this one. I know they don't have Sam Taylor. And that's that's a big loss back there. But the depth of the Giants midfield, I think, can balance out that midfield thing. And there's just something about the Giants, the way they're playing this year. I like them. Carlton, I'm still a little sketchy on. They played way too many close games. They've, they've played down to opponents. Will they play up to the Giants will be the biggest question. I'm going to tip the Giants in this one. I think the firepower up front against a weakened back line could spell disaster for the Blues. I'm going to tip the Giants in this one. I'm going to go with you on that one. I'm going to say the Giants, and as they say in Australia, I'm, I'm, I'm tipping the Giants just Mm -hmm. yep. But I think I'm... you make a, a very good point with um, with the injuries to Saad and McGovern. I mean, that, that's huge to, to, to cover that, um, uh, you know, to cover those losses. And it's interesting, too, because this also has a little bit of a, of a free man, a free mental parallel, because people, the, the real forgotten person in the in the, in the side for free mental that everyone is not really thinking about is Brennan Cox mm -hmm. down back and having to play a young player like Josh Draper. Um, who's still learning. I mean, he's doing admirably, but he is still learning. And when you have him on the second best forward of a lot of clubs, that can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. But going back to the Giants and um, and Carlton, yeah, Carlton are really exciting from the midfield up. And but but their back line, their back six, yeah, they're, they're definitely going to be in deep trouble with two of their two of their choice players out. Um, so yeah, if if this were, I think. If you had those two guys in for Carlton, then I probably would tip Carlton. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm going to be I'm, I'm picking GWS in this because my thing would be is this: if all four of the players that went out this week were in, I'd probably tip Carlton just because I think Taylor can take one, but the other could get loose. Mm -hmm. The fact that Weedering will take Hogan, but then it's who takes Green now with Sod and McGovern both out. So you don't have that intercepting mark, which I think could could call, spell disaster for Carlton with the Finn Callahan's with, and it sounds like Callum Ward should be healthy enough that he'll probably step in for for Canelio. So really, there is very little. You lose Taylor, I think they can band together and kind of handle that one. Where Carlton, who steps in for Sod? There are very few players yeah. that can do what Sod does, and McGovern. His brother is about the only one that's better at intercept marking in, in the competition. Yeah. So I, I, they're two big losses, which is really funny because the betting odds actually have Carlton as a favorite. So I, I found that kind of fascinating uh, that we both tipped the Giants. As we said, a cracker up at the Brisbane, up at the up at the Gabba in Brisbane as the Lions host the Cats, an all feline affair on this one. Who do you like, Lions, Cats? I'm picking the lines, but one one little other quick note on Carlton and GWS. With Adam Sadow, who are the fans going to make that noise for? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's when what the I mean. comes out of the back line, I mean, <laughs> even, and, and, you know, the, like everything else with footy and being a fan in North America, it, it was fun learning about where that tradition came from with with Carlton. But uh, you know, I don't know who they're going to make that noise for anymore. But getting probably back not. to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're probably, probably saving only for so, so, so maybe that goes on the injured <laughs> list. You know, maybe that. 
it won't even be a test. It'll be out for a while. Um, <laughs> but with, with Brisbane and, and Geelong, um, I am going to, I'm going for Brisbane here. Uh, even though Geelong are undefeated and they, they just put uh, North to the sword last week. I really like what Brisbane um, were able to do in taking it up to, to, to Melbourne and bringing it now back home. I think it was a big confidence booster for, for them. And uh, yeah, I, I think that, I think Brisbane are well and truly showing signs of returning very, you know, kind of in the similar vein with Collingwood and you can't mm-hmm. ever count the two, uh, the two grand finalists out. And so I definitely like uh, Brisbane in this one. See, for me, I'm going to tip the cats because Zach Bailey's injury, I think is a one that hurts them. And when it comes to the cats, there's so much depth going forward. Kala Jasny sounds like he should be back. Reese Stanley's coming off probably one of his better performances. And I think athletically he's going to test big Oscar. And who does Harris Andrews take? Does he take Cameron, which would then drag him upfield? Because even if Hawkins doesn't play, there's some there's a lot of weapons up forward. I, I yeah. worry Brisbane does not have the defensive ability to be able to stop a lot of the firepower. The midfields, I think, will be even. Yes, you've got yes, you've got McCluggage. Yes, you've got Dunkley. Yes, you've got uh Lockie Neal. But the scrappiness of this Geelong midfield, I think, is going to be interesting. Is can they even this game out? If they can even this game out, Geelong has more firepower. Geelong has just as much firepower as Brisbane, and it's the accuracy. I'm going to tip the Cats in this one. They haven't been as strong. The Lions have not been as strong up the Gabba, and I think the Bailey injury, I think, could throw their forward line for just a little bit of salute. I'm going to go for a tiny bit of an upset. I'm going to tip the Cats in this one. Okay. So okay. fascinating one. We will jump out to the one that I know you will have your popcorn completely out and ready for even no 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 i'm on i'm a keto man i can't you know i can i can have <laughs> keto friendly ice cream but i don't know All right. keto friendly ice cream well, the fun, at well, the fun part about a.m pacific time i know i was just about to say i'm like it's it starts it starts at 3 10 a.m for you i mean this this starts 5 10 for me so this isn't it isn't too bad an early wake up if i wanted to get up for this opta stadium the derby west coast v Fremantle. head or heart tip on this one um, I think both head and heart go with Fremantle here. I think that Fremantle are going to be too good for West Coast. I think West Coast had that had that great win last week, um, but I don't think that they're going to be able to match it with with Fremantle, um, especially with the way that Fremantle's back six have been playing. And I think that Fremantle will score uh, enough this time with Darcy and Frederick back in the mix. Um, I think this is going to prove to be uh, a steadier right here. It's going to be a good test of their composure. And, you know, my, my, my mantra this whole week has been don't, us, uh, don't underestimate West Coast. But I do like uh, the Dockers here winning comfortably. I'm going to tip the Dockers on this one. I think this is, I think this is a fascinating one. This, this could be an absolute cracking game because if Harley Reed and Elliot Yo are playing like they did, it'll be fun to see them match up with Brayshaw and Sarong. It'll be a fascinating one. And if Darcy is back, I think that gives a big ruck advantage to the West Coast. Uh, even if Jack, even if Darcy doesn't play and Jack's still in there, I think the ruck, the the ruck dominance could be the thing that sways this one. So I have the Dockers in this one. An interesting one for me on a sun at a, on a Saturday night for me, Saturday Sunday afternoon in in Sydney as the at the SCG as the Sydney Swans host the up and coming Gold Coast Suns on this one. I will say this: I'm going to tip the Swans in this one. I think the bye week is is very well timed. I think Gold Coast, there's a lot of young, raw talent, but they're going to be facing a very, a very experienced side and a side that plays that they've had some trouble when Gold Coast, when they're not strong, when Gold Coast plays better, Sydney plays up to them. So it'd be fascinating. I'm going to tip the Swans in this one. I think this is a classically great, close match. I think the Swans just by a couple of goals on this one, but this is going to be a fun one on a Saturday night for me. And yours? Yeah, I, you know, I actually see Sydney winning by more than a couple of goals on this one. I think I think early on, uh, you know, the Suns will take it to them. Um, but I think Sydney, as you said, experience you, you can't under you can't undervalue experience. And um, and plus, I really like Sydney playing at home in this one. Um, I think that they're going to win comfortably here. I'll take the Swans. All right, and then the most intriguing seventeen v eighteen matchup that we've Come ever on. seen: Marvel Stadium North. Hawthorne, who do you like? 
you know, based on what I like to watch when the home and away season goes on, you know, if you're going to have a 17 v 18 contest, why schedule it to the end of the round? And when you do that, we say, turn it up. No. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And this is going to be one, Donnie, I have to be honest with you. I'm going to be just <laughs> – I'm I'm really going to hope it gets over early so Bounce will will jump in right there and, and all the banter <laughs> – that's going to happen between Gazy and and uh, and Ben Dixon. Oh, actually, you know, you've got well, you've got two former Hawks and Ben Dixon and Jason Dunstall, and then a Hawk supporter and Andrew Gaze. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be really something in that one. But boy, oh boy, the the thing that's intriguing, the only <laughs> thing really intriguing for me playing out is not going to be on the field, but in the coaching box. Mm -hmm. We have Alistair Clarkson and you know his former star player Sam Mitchell. Um, Wow, this is this is a really hard one. It, it's so funny when you have seventeen v eighteen. This is and, and it's kind of for me the hardest match to to tip. Mm -hmm. um, wow, I really think, boy, they both are coming off oh, beltings too. So, oh boy, I, and I and I promise you, Donnie, I won't do the cop out and say it'll be a draw. <laughs> I, I won't do that. I was waiting for I it. Feel, I almost feel like doing rock, paper, scissors here, but um, you know what? I, I'm going to go with North. I'm going to go with North in this one. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, you know, you know, we, we mentioned the players on North side and, you know, Luke Davies, Uniac is someone else who's, who's a young talent and all that. Um, and I think as much as Sam Mitchell probably wants to beat his old mentor, I'm going to go with the mentor in this one, I'm going to go with Alistair Clarkson, and I'm going to say that North, in, in a tight one, are going to beat Hawthorne. And and we'll, we will we will disagree again. But I, again, this this is one of those. I don't think I don't think either really is a huge favorite. I don't think either really inspires a ton of confidence in me. For me, it's super young, super talented North versus youngish a little bit more experienced Hawthorne. Like there's not a, there, there's very, very little separation between these two. I yeah. just think Hawthorne's midfield is a little more veteran is a little more experienced. And I think going forward, there's a little more firepower in depth with Chol, with Ginevan. You've got a few more after Larky is Ford and Curtis going to be enough to scare the Hawthorne Hawks. I'm going to tip the Hawks in this one only because, like I said, I think the depth going forward is a little more dangerous. And I think with the lack of height and, and strength, Charlie Common has come in and played actually really well for them, but he can't do it all himself. Aiden Core has unfortunately just never really worked out since coming down from GWS. He's just been really inconsistent. I found him very frustrating in that game against Geelong because I think a couple of goals specifically his lack of leadership back there, I think were the reasons that they happened. So I'm going to tip Hawthorne in this one, but I, I'm, I'm one of those, I was like you, I'm sitting here going back and forth. I think I tipped each of them at least four or five times because I'm like, well, no. well, So I'm going to tip Hawthorne on this one, but again, neither team inspires a ton of confidence in this one. And then are you really going to be watching this at 1 a.m. your time? At least for me, well, they, cut a, they cut a little bit of a break. It's going to be 11 o'clock at night. I will probably go, I will be honest with you, I will probably go back and forth with my Swans fans about how the result goes from that. And I will probably go to bed and watch it on tape. To, I will probably watch it on tape delay um, the next morning, sit, later Sydney, Sunday morning, and then probably go right into bounce right after. Now you do after realize that. you're dating yourself with the expression tape delay. Our younger <laughs> viewers watching this are not going to have On any demand. Idea what delay means. What, <laughs> any, uh, wh wh where's their tape involved? <laughs> I will I will watch this on demand later through the app. I will I will definitely oh, that's, that's okay. My wife caught me the other day because she mentioned the show and I said, What channel is it on? She's like, Channel? Do you mean streaming service? I'm like, Yeah, okay. You got me there. Uh yeah. You 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 are surprised surprising some of the things that pop out. Uh, so well, that's it. All eight games have been tipped. Like I said, we, we are mere hours away from the first one. I know this is going to come out after the first game has come out. So I do apologize on that. It's sometimes just scheduling works out that way. But again, I always have fun chatting with Gil and all of my co-hosts on footy. So Gil, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast. It's always great to sit here and talking footy with you.
No, it's great. It's great to be with you. And, you know, it, it, it's funny because I had to remind myself that we're hours away and it, it just warms my heart. And, you know, I'm thinking about that, that intro music uh, on Fox footy. And, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to watch tonight because it's a school day for me tomorrow, but just, just, it's, it's funny. Uh, I think you and I both can appreciate this, that when it's springtime in North America and you've got major league baseball and AFL running concurrently, uh, it, you, it, it takes, I don't know what could make me happier as, as a sports fan and as a lover of, uh, you know, just Australian culture and everything else. It, it just, it's a, it's a great feeling to know it's like your best friend has come back and is going to be with you for the next how many months living at your home. It, it's a, it's a great feeling. Yeah. It's one of the, I joked, I joked with a few friends of mine. I said, come, come early March when the Sanford W got started. I said, I said, I literally told my wife, I said, honey, I said, there will basically be footy on from now until December. And she just yeah. kind of gave me a grin because she knows that's kind of the way it goes when it comes to me covering the state leagues and everything like that. It, it is in, it is absolutely mental sometimes, but it's so much fun because when you love yeah. the sport so much, it's hard not to just immerse yourself in it so now is like, your wife convert is she a swan supporter like she like is a, she is a swan supporter yes i don't know if i would call her a sub full-on supporter she she does she cheers she loves the she loves the floggers the giant um, oh yeah i've held one those things are hard to exactly oh. so it's yeah. it's the one thing that if we ever get to australia i i have a, I have a friend in the cheer squad that has said that she will let her be able to to see one of those so it's one of those bucket list ones that if I can get up everything together and yeah. get us down to Australia, I would love to do that. You, but you, yes, have to, you have to do that. If you can just let me say one thing, because I'll tell you something. Um, my wife and I have been together 25 years, uh, 22 is a married couple. And one of the memories that I will never, ever forget and that I will always cherish was back in 2016 when I was doing some promo work for my book and uh, the people at uh, the publishing company in Melbourne sent us up to Sydney for me to do some TV to promote it. And it just so happened. And this is when the footy gods were totally smiling on us. It just so happened because my wife is a huge Swan supporter and she found her Swans before I found my Dockers. Right. Mm -hmm. So I got to take my wife to her first Swans home match at the SCG. And we're walking down the street and uh, you know, to, to go to the SCG and their homes that are draped in, you know, red and white and everything like that. And I'm looking over to my wife and she's shedding tears. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of our first dates were watching footy matches and she just really gravitated to the swans. And so to be able to take her to the hearth, to the, you know, to where everything goes down, it was just, uh, it, it was incredible. And the only thing that spoiled it that night was damn him, Jason Johannesson. <laughs> <laughs> just fresh fresh off of a hamstring fresh off the uh fresh back into the side after overcoming a hamstring injury unleashes a 55 meter set shot bomb in the final minute nearly on the siren for the western bulldogs to to beat city in what turned out really to be a grand final preview that mm -hmm. was the only thing but she got to go down uh we got to go down on the ground when uh, when this still was happening and, and kicked the footy around on the ground and everything like that. And it's just, it's one of the memories that I'll always treasure about us being together. Yeah, that's, and that's absolutely fantastic. Like I said, I, I hope that that will be able to transpire. I, I know it's not, it's not going to be cheap, but I'm starting to kind of try to save as much as possible, but it'll definitely be fun. So that is going to do it for another episode of Donnie's Disposals. Again, ladies and gentlemen, keep an eye out. More coverage still to come. Again, we will have our monthly reviews when it comes to the Sandful, the Waffle, and the VFL and as always, this, and then as we get closer, closer to the women's competition as well. So thank you again for listening to the episode of Donnie's Disposal. We'll be back with more footy coverage very, very soon.